Hi everyone. Let's do a brief history of type. Let's talk about where language comes from and how typography has developed over the years. If we go back in time to when we had rock art and cave paintings, you see that the way we communicated with one another was drawing pictures, telling stories through images. We've always done that. That's a quality of human nature that uh, we have the ability to, to create art and tell stories and communicate visually with one another. Over time, nobody knows quite when, language was developed as a way to communicate in a more complex form. That's where we get into pictograms and ideograms. And there's a slight difference between the two. A pictogram is an image that is meant to represent something that uh, bison on the cave wall could be considered a pictogram. An ideogram is something more like this, calligraphy, where the shape and the style of the letter represents an idea. It doesn't necessarily look like the object, but it's meant to represent something. And these are some early forms of, of Chinese calligraphy based on brush strokes and a drawing style and concepts, complex concepts, are recorded uh, in the style of the letter. This is an ancient cuneiform style of writing, which was developed in ancient Sumeria and was done on clay tablets where they would use uh, some sort of a metal device to press and create combinations of symbols that would represent uh, a more complex idea. Again, this is a form of ideogram disconnecting the, the way the letter looks from the message or the concept that it uh, represents. Hieroglyphics, on the other hand, are pictograms. They are objects that are drawn to look and represent like something. And by combining those images together, you create a message, you tell a story. But it's more uniform, or at least it's more organized than just a random drawing on a wall, they actually have rules and a structure and a way to combine those letters and symbols together to have different meanings. And these are different ways to approach the same problem. How do you record an idea? Do you record that idea by memorizing symbols and creating a, a language or an alphabet? Or do you convey ideas by creating little graphic pictures of those objects and when they are combined in a sequence, someone could read it or interpret it or understand its meaning. Another form of hieroglyphics are like these that you see in Mayan culture. Uh, these are really fascinating to me because uh, not only are they little pictograms, but they are also done in a similar format. So every face, every silhouette is fitted into the same uh, square shape. And so it's an interesting design challenge, I think, where the, the craftsperson, the artist, develop these little shapes and drawings to fit in the same format. Whereas in Egyptian lettering, uh, they stacked in columns their uh, pictograms. The pictograms themselves followed a format and a logic, but it was expandable in these uh, uh, top to bottom columns. Whereas kind of in the Mayan hieroglyphs, they would fit them in these modular shapes that would be stacked. And um, what makes this language difficult to understand is you have to have context. You have to know who was drawn in that little profile picture. Or you have to understand, okay, that Jaguar symbol represents something. And you have to have the context of what that meant to the ancient uh, society that created it. Same thing with hieroglyphics, with Egyptian hieroglyphics you'd have to understand who that represented. And maybe to the person in that era, they understood exactly who was being drawn. But uh, to us, with no context, we don't understand. We don't know who it, who it represents. This was an effective way to communicate, especially with an illiterate society. You could convey a complex idea, and as long as you recognize the shape and symbol, you understood the meaning. But it wasn't a written form, so it wasn't 
recording exact words and phrases, but instead it was recording ideas. The next advancement in human history was the development of an alphabet. Alphabet would allow you to record exact words and phrases uh, in, your, uh, in your text. And so this is where you start to see things that look familiar to us. This is a Greek alphabet recorded on the side of a, a limestone tablet. A lot of those symbols and shapes look familiar to us because they are phonetic symbols that we recognize that we have adopted and inherited in our alphabet today. These are Roman letters, same thing, <clears throat> based on a similar structure as the Greek alphabet, but we recognize those letters. Even though it's written in Latin, we recognize the letter E or the V or the C or the A. Those same letters exist in our English alphabet today. And we've inherited that language, that alphabet from these ancient societies. This is a picture of something called the Rosetta Stone. Now, as I said earlier, if you don't have context for a hieroglyphic language, it's very hard to decipher and understand what it's actually saying. Well, this was one of the first clues that historians found to be able to unlock uh, language. This Rosetta Stone had a combination of Greek lettering, Latin lettering, and then also Egyptian writing. And so scholars were, for the first time, were able to compare what was written and they got their first taste and understanding of what Egyptian writing actually meant. So they were able to make a relationship between these three things that were written in these three different languages and they could then unlock what uh, Egyptian was actually saying. One of those significant historical finds uh, in the past. Next major advancement, once you have a language, a written language with an alphabet, which allows you to write words and phrases, the well, next thing you're gonna do is create a book, right? Well, when it comes to creating books, for you know, generations, the only way to create a book was to hand write a book on papyrus or some other form of, of animal skin. And that was done in a handmade process where in this case, we've got a monk writing down uh, religious writings in a calligraphy form, one by one, one page at a time, and uh, spending years, decades, writing one book. And so knowledge and information, stories, and recorded history uh, was left to these religious scholars who had the time and spent the effort and the energy creating these, this vast library of handmade books. Uh, a lot of times we call this illuminated manuscripts where you have, uh, in this case, the Bible written in Latin and done by hand by a very talented and precise artisan who would write the calligraphy one by one and then embellish the document with beautiful artwork and even gold, gold leaf and other fancy materials to make this a really special and priceless heirloom. These types of books were, were beautiful in their decoration and their ornamentation. But it was again, based on the writing process, based on a handmade calligraphy process. And in that process, many different lettering styles were developed to enhance and to decorate uh, the alphabet. Well, eventually we get to the era of the Renaissance and technological development where we get to a man named Johannes Gutenberg who invented the printing press. And his first task was to print copies of the Bible where before the Bible had only been handwritten and passed down from one monastery to another in a very limited fashion. With the invention of the printing press, it was now possible to make multiple copies. And the significant part of this development was to be able to create letters as individual metal slugs, which were then arranged and bound together to make a printable plate, which would then print one page at a time, the pages of the Bible. And so this was a, a dramatic advancement in technology where suddenly language went from being a, a spoken to a handwritten to now a mechanical process 
that could be duplicated. And that duplication is what made it special. This is an example of those, uh, those metal slugs, those metal letters, where one by one, one letter at a time, one word at a time, one phrase at a time, pages were constructed. And while that was a very difficult and, and hard and labor intensive process, it still was faster than trying to hand write uh, pages in a book. Besides, once you spent the time of constructing one printing plate, you could then print hundreds and thousands of copies of that page without having to do another setup. So that printing process is very significant in the development of typography and design. And constructing a page, selecting a typeface, designing the layout is an early form of graphic design. Um, not long after the development of the printing press, many other advancements in printing and reproduction were created, uh, whether it was uh, woodcuts or etching and engraving, where you could suddenly combine with the printed text a printed image, which would then be reproduced as opposed to someone painstakingly drawing one image per book. Now you could print copies of those images. Now that led to an entirely new profession, typesetting, which lasted for hundreds of years, where uh, technical uh, people would put together printed pages using better and better and more refined materials, all the way down to making really precise and pristine uh, books and printed copies. So this is you know, somewhere from the 16, 17, 18, even into the 1900s, where fonts were developed, type was um, perfected, and these different printing methods were honed to, uh, to their perfect outcome. Um, this is an example of typesetting done in the 1800s, where now not only do you have you know, mechanical type, but you also get into a very decorated and, um, and drawn type, not unlike the calligraphy of the past, but in this case, done in a manner and a method that could be reprinted. Once you get into the 1900s, in what we might consider the modern era, you get into more decorative and, you know, a very fast development in different kinds of technology advancing, you know, every year, a new way, a new method for printing and decorating type. Uh, here's an early example from Art Nouveau. This is something done by Alphonse Mucha, a poster design where the type was incorporated into the painting, into the image and printed in full color. Um, you also get into something new in, in the 1900s, something that wasn't seen before is uh, sans serif typefaces. You know, at the very beginning, type was based on calligraphy, so it always had kind of a, a tilt, a swoosh, a, a smooth connecting line. And over the years, it slowly developed into a more precise, pristine letter form until ultimately it became just an entirely geometric process where letters, where all the serifs were lopped off he had square straight letters. Later on, you get into more um, what we might call photographic type where the camera was brought into the printing process and you could do more advanced compositions and do more interesting combinations of letters and type. All the way until now today when you get into the computer, being able to do any type of design. What I find really interesting is that based on this history and where we've come from, there are still some things that persist from the past. Um, here you have kind of a modern design style done by um, David Carson. And he's known for doing things that have kind of an abstract look, an interesting combination of natural photographic and then also um, computer aided design. And he's, he's really known for doing this abstract kind of um, asymmetrical, um, distorted, distressed type. He's kind of known for doing that. 
which in my mind is kind of a throwback to when things were handmade and kind of imperfect. But think about this. We're still painting on cave walls, aren't we? Except now we use a spray can instead of a charcoal stick. But it's interesting to see how the letter form has changed and how imagery and the concept of storytelling hasn't. Now we decorate with full color using all different kinds of mediums, but we still like to draw on walls. I think that's kind of interesting. And we still use hieroglyphs. If you look at your phone, you look at your computer screen, we still use pictograms and ideograms to represent ideas, complex ideas. So if you look at a, a computer icon, you know, what is that? Does that remind you of those little Mayan symbols, those little square shapes where you have to fit the concept into that same shape? Except now we have a computer screen that can show it in full color, but we still have to draw little symbols and shapes to convey an idea. And so our modern society has inherited all these different forms of language and communication. We're able to take symbols, hieroglyphs, alphabetic letters, language, culture, all these things we've inherited, we still use to inform our visual communication. And I think as a modern designer, it's important to look to the past to understand where we are and how we've been able to develop what we have and to still see that as human beings, we still need to communicate with one another and we still use some of these basic ideas and basic ways of communicating, even using hieroglyphs and uh, by painting on walls. All right, so that's a brief history. Hopefully that has been a little bit entertaining and educational. See you next time.